it's a real delight and a pleasure um, to be here today to, to give a, the Monty Shapiro um, talk. And uh, the subject of my talk is going to be on the nature of human tragedies. Just a little bit about um, uh, Monty Shapiro. Um, he actually was born in Zimbabwe, what is now Zimbabwe, and was uh, uh, shot down as a um, an uh, Air Force crew and spent some time as a POW, which is very interesting because I've been reading up about his life story. Um, Stephen Morley um, described him as uh, in the Guardian on the, his obituary as somebody who was um, infinitely patient, tolerant, empathic, non-judgmental, and he was also described as enthusiastic about the process of science. And really, it's about science that I wanted to talk to you today about. Now, Shapiro was also very keen on the idea of the clinical applications of Pavlovian learning theory, the way in which we adapt to our environments according to the situations that impinge upon us. He was very interested in experimental method and then interestingly also in linking um, psychological processes to what we understand about the brain. He had an interest in single case design and he was very keen on the well-being of his patients. And so I hope that the talk I give today will be in the spirit of uh, Monty Shapiro's way of thinking about things. So let us begin then by thinking about psychology. Now psychology is really concerned with the big questions about the nature of mind, looking below the surfaces. So we don't just rely on observations, we actually have a scientific approach to the study of the mind. And of course, clinical psychology, or again, once again, I'm not sure that's the best term, but anyway, we'll stay with it at the moment, um, is looking at the nature of the causes in terms of the prevention and relief of uh, mental suffering. So that's what we do. So we use our psychology to try to understand the origins and the uh, how to prevent and also how to relieve mental suffering. Now, actually, in reality, that means that all of the helping professions, psychology, medicine, nursing, have within them, have bedded within them, the compassion motivation. And compassionate motivation is now pretty well established, we can define it pretty good, in terms of a sensitivity to suffering in self and others with a commitment to try to relieve and prevent it. And that gives rise to two psychologies. The first psychology is the ability to engage with suffering, to turn towards it. So if you think about the people who went to uh, West Africa to help with the Ebola virus, sometimes compassion requires quite a lot of courage, the ability to get involved. Some of the work that we do, listening to some of the, the tragic stories of people's lives, requires quite a lot of courage because we're going to be able to tolerate that suffering. And of course, when it comes to helping our clients, they too are going to need to develop courage in order to work with some of the problems that they have. The second psychology is the preparedness, not just to base it on intention, but actually on wisdom. And this is where the science comes in, in part. So if I see somebody fall into the Thames and I think, oh my God, they're going to drown, I would jump in and save them. That's good intention and it may be very courageous, but if I can't swim, it's not very wise, is it really? It's not very good. So let's think about science. There are many models of science, but here's one that's commonly used, where we start off with observations, and then we try to understand what is generating the phenomena that we observe. We have theories, we develop research in this kind of interacting process. And we know that biases can creep in at all levels. And uh, for psychotherapy research, we have this process, and this then leads to interventions. But what this actually says at the bottom here is the interventions come out of this process of observation and then a concern with, um, uh, with process. Now this is important because biases can creep in in all of these areas and unfortunately this is what has happened because a lot of the therapies that we have are frankly based on observations. They were very charis charismatic, mostly males who made observations, be it Freud or Jung or back about processes, and then off we went and developed these therapies based on these person's observations, and we did research and all the rest of it. But what we've got now is a whole series of different groups. So we've got CBT, DBT, ACT, CAT, 
as my wife says, it's therapy for pussies. Uh, <laughs> I'm not really. Uh, B, T, S, T, I, P, T, the KGB. Oh, my goodness, got loads of them. Um, and they're all then putting money in to compare themselves with each other. And I think that's a complete waste of money. Uh, and we need to be thinking about, actually, what do we have in common? What do we know about psychological process and psychological intervention? We also have to be aware that we can be overly focused on individuals and there is a lot of concerns in the profession about the focusing on the problem being in the individual, be it in unconscious conflicts, be it in dysfunctional beliefs, whatever it is. When in reality, what we know is that individuals are responding to environments. So if we think of smoking, for example, then we could focus on the individual, that's one way of doing it. But it's, it's cancer. And smoking arises because there is such a thing as tobacco, which was introduced by Walter Raleigh, and there are such things as cigarette companies that are very happy to sell cigarettes and are continuing to do so around the world, even though they know they produce cancer. So the question is, if you want to reduce cancer and the link between smoking and cancer, you go after the um, companies and you introduce legislation so that people cannot smoke in certain areas. So it's really important, I think, that we begin to understand the social aspects of some of the problems of which we face. When we think about some of the common things of therapy, we actually have a, a really good armamentarium of agreed common type of interventions. So for example, as John Marzilia was saying just earlier in another talk, the therapeutic relationship, extremely important. A lot of evidence that a positive therapeutic relationship based on trust in a safe environment is really important. Socratic questions, guided discovery, thought monitoring, inference chains, mindfulness, loads and loads of interventions that we can help our uh, young clinicians learn how to engage with their patients and how to help their patients begin to understand how their mind works, which is going to be really key. And so what's important then is the models that we have and the way we think about what causes some of the dysfunction, some of the difficulties that people have, can lead to our understanding about the sources of those difficulties, interventions and process, and interventions and prevention. And one of the things I want to say very clearly is that the model that you have is going to influence all three of these. So I want to ask this question then. So where should the science of clinical psychology root itself? If we're going to understand process, where should we begin? Where should we begin in order to understand minds? And I like this quote from uh, Wilson, who makes the point that our troubles, he says, arise from the fact that we do not know what we are and cannot agree on, on what we want to be. The primary cause of this intellectual failure is ignorance of our origins. We did not arrive on this planet as aliens. Humanity is part of nature, a species that evolved among other species. The more closely we identify ourselves with the rest of life, the more quickly we will be able to discover the source of our human sensibility and acquire the knowledge on which an enduring ethic, a sense of preferred direction can be built. And I think this is really important because when I talk to some young clinical psychologists, they have very, very vague ideas about the fact that the human brain is an evolved organ and as such, it carries a lot of problems with it. So here we are, this is called the flow of life. We're at the top of the tree there. And being part of the flow of life has a lot of implications. So I believe that a science, a clinical psychological science, has to begin by understanding what problems has the evolved brain handed to humanity. And I'm going to argue that there are some very serious problems that are inherent in the nature of brain design. And for that, we need to use evolutionary function analysis. So we're going to be looking at the functions, the evolved functions of certain aspects of our motives and our emotions. Interestingly, the, the evolutionary approach to uh, mental health problems is not new. Of course, Freud, Jung, Borby, they all had an evolutionary understanding and rooted their therapies in an evolutionary understanding. If you read Tim Beck's 1985 book, the first third of the book is all about the evolved mechanisms upon which cognitions operate. Isaac Martz wrote a fantastic book on fears, phobias, and rituals, obsessions. I think in 87, again, which is all about the evolutionary aspects of defensive behaviors. 
Tim Beck also wrote a lot about the evolutionary mechanisms underp uh, underpinning depression in terms of coping with uh, failures and also wrote about how evolved strategies are involved in personality disorders. And it's, it's really quite important that if we're coming into clinical science, we understand that actually at the root of a lot of our science is some really deep and important evolutionary thinking. It's not just about teaching people about cognitive beliefs or distorted cognitions. So I was uh, extremely interested in all this, and uh, in the 80s and 90s, I wrote a couple of books which were addressing the evolutionary basis of uh, what I called suffering. So my 89 book was called um, Human Nature and Suffering, and that was followed up with a book called The Evolution of Powerlessness, about looking at what happens when people uh, are deprived of power, the, the psychology of oppression, really. And you can be oppressed by the outside, but you can also be oppressed by your own negative beliefs, your own self-critical process. So let me just take you on a little journey around um, evolution then. Here is the guy, Charles Robert Darwin. And Darwin pointed out that the process of evolution is one of adaptation uh, to the natural selection comes from the challenges of survival and reproduction. And those challenges are the things that drive the mental mechanisms and, and physical mechanisms in the directions of change. But what's really interesting um, is the fact that uh, a lot of what happens in evolution is not about the creation of good design. So for example, cons consider why don't we have unbreakable bones? Well, it's called a trade-off because we could have unbreakable bones, but then they'd be very large, we'd need more muscle, we'd have to eat more, and so on. So we have the bones we have because we are a species that, fo uh, that evolved in a particular niche. We were scavengers, we were nimble. Think of, this, think of the, the genes that give rise to malaria protection. They're the same genes that give rise to sickle cell anemia. Evolution doesn't come up with good designs, it has trade-offs. Think of the fact that your stress system, like with cortisol, also can mess up your immune system. It's not a good design. Think of the fact that our emotions and our moods give us texture and color, but they can also drive us crazy. They're not always well designed. Here's some other examples. Plumage. Think of the peacock's tail. This peacock's tail, which is fantastic, but it's a disaster for running away from predators. The antlers of deer can be great, but they can get caught up in branches, and then basically the deer starves. They're very, they're, they use a lot of resources, and also they can be very damaging to uh, um, their contestants when they get into fights. What about fireflies that grow in the dark? They're great, because predators can spot them immediately and they get eaten. So why would you evolve these things? Well, because all of these things have a capacity for advancing sexual attraction. So there's a downside, there's an upside in this, but there's a serious downside. Vomiting, diarrhea, and coughing, right? People often think of those as diseases, but they're not, they're defenses. But many, many children around the world will die of dehydration because the vomiting process and the diarrhea process doesn't turn off. So it's very important that we understand that the very things that can help us can also, in certain circumstances, be the things that actually damage us. Think of hands-free. This is a good one, standing up. Hands-free, standing up, right? If you watch chimpanzees, they walk with their legs apart. Okay, but in order for us to walk upright with hands free, our legs come together. And what does that do? It narrows the birth canal right at the point when the mother is, uh, when, the, when the humans are evolving to have bigger head babies. The, dis the impact of that is that humans have the most dangerous and painful birth of all primates. It's a, not a very good design. Now why is this important? It's important because the human brain is riddled with this kind of nonsense. It's full of all of these kinds of trade-offs and problems in design. The human brain was not designed by a designer. It's been thrown together over evolutionary time to uh, solve certain kinds of problems. And that has serious, serious implications that clinical psychology, I would like to see in the future, really starts to address. One of them, of course, is the fact that many of our emotions and motor systems are very old, and they were designed over many millions of years for survival and reproduction. 
But what we also know is about two million years ago, maybe a little earlier, a little later, humans started to get smart. And they evolved a new type of brain that was capable of all kinds of amazing things. Language symbols. We are a self-monitoring. We have self-monitoring. You'll never see a chimpanzee standing under a tree taking their pulse thinking, oh my god, that's far too fast. Or looking at their reflection in a river or a lake and thinking, God, have I put on weight? I mean, that's terrible. Humans do this all the time. We self-monitor, monitor, monitor. This is a new psychological system. Capacities to be self-critical. Capacities to be frightened of what actually happens in our heads. Animals are frightened by what will happen to them, but they're not frightened by what they're going to do. Humans can be. So we have this whole new capacity for thinking, which is two million years old, but it's running on very old psychology, very old motivational systems. And this forms loops in the mind that can be very damaging to us and very damaging to people around us. So imagine the zebra running away from a lion and the zebra gets away. What happens is their arousal will calm down very quickly, but because of new brain, they can go on thinking about what might have happened if they got caught. Can you imagine being caught by a lion? What would it be like to be eaten alive? And supposing there are two lions tomorrow, and then you can't get to the water hole. And then you're gonna, if the lions don't get you, you're gonna dehydrate, oh my God. And then of course you blame yourself. Why am I living in this lion infected country when I could be in London at the conference? That was ridiculous. <laughs> so the point about it is, is that we have brought the stimulus inside the head and we know this. So if you lay in bed and you fantasize about something you're angry about, you'll be able to re-stimulate a whole range of physiological systems. If you lay in bed and think naughty, sexy thoughts, you'll do the same. So this new brain is really interesting, but it's linking with the old brain in very complex ways. Now, psychodynamic therapists, Freud and Jung, they were very interested in the old brain process. That's what they were interested in, and how old brain processes were constantly trying to express itself. Cognitive therapies, on the other hand, are interested in new brain processes and how you're thinking and you're monitoring and you're interpreting and your imagination play on old brain processes. The fact of the matter is, it's a two-way street. So I'd also like to now bring you to a more philosophical and important point about what it is to be human. The first thing is to recognize that we are all built by our genes. And that means that none of you, none of me, none of me, <laughs> neither me, um, chose to be the person that we are. We didn't choose to have a brain that's ca capable of anger and anxiety and depression and love and sex. That's all being built into you. Okay, so the, the bodies that you have, even the fact that you're male or female, that wasn't designed by you, that was designed by your genes. You are gene built and you've been built to do certain things. And it's a bit of a lottery, really, because you inherit the genes from mum and dad. Some of you will be lucky and have genes that allow you to be reasonably healthy. Others of you will have genes that orientate you or make you vulnerable to certain kinds of illnesses and certain kinds of conditions. And we also know that genes can actually have an impact on recovery. And we're also beginning to look at the fact that genes or some genetic variations may have an impact on the kinds of psychological therapy. This is science, right? The science is telling us about how our minds actually work, and we can develop the therapies according to what we understand about process. The second thing is that all of us are aware that life is relatively short. We have about 25,000 days, and all of us have to live with the reality that our life at any point can be hit by tragedies, illnesses, people we love may die, bad things happen, we may lose our jobs. And this understanding about the nature of suffering, the nature of impermanence of all things, has been at the root of many spiritual traditions, particularly Buddhism, but also the Greeks. The concept of the Greek tragedies were based on the idea that life is about suffering. And many of the early religions believed that because life is so terrible, there has to be a better place, right? There's got to be a better place. All you have to do is to work out how to get there. So it's the next life. So the, the Christians that were happy to go to the lions, or perhaps not so happy, but they all believed that there was a better place they were going to. And what's also very important is for us to understand the contextual, social contextualism of genes. Genes are not the fates. We now know there's a process called methylation. Genes actually get changed, or at least their expression gets changed according to their environment. 
the stress that children are under in their early lives has a big impact on how genes express themselves and how brains build themselves. The example we give to children is that if I was kidnapped as a three-day-old baby and brought up in a violent drug gang, stolen from the hospital I was to be brought up in this violent drug gang, this version of Paul Gilbert would not exist. A totally different version of Paul Gilbert, somebody who may be very aggressive, might be covered in tattoos. I don't personally like tattoos. This version doesn't like tattoos very much. But, um, we are just versions of ourselves. And in the evolutionary model, we don't think so much about psychopathology or this disorder or that disorder. You can do that. But what version has this person become? And what versions of themselves are possible? So even we know that even people who have uh, done bad things in the right conditions, particularly if they feel loved and valued, can change. New versions of themselves can emerge. They can literally start to reorganize and find different potentials within themselves. And I think that's a really nice way in which um, psychologists can start to address people that all of us have many, many potential versions within us. And so what's really important is that this, these loops that are created in the mind are contextualized by culture. The kinds of loops that we create, for good or for bad, are very much influenced by the social environments in which we operate. And this means that we need to understand the importance of phenotypes, that phenotypes are the expression of genes according to how environments have operated upon them. And in fact, in 1995, I published this paper called A Biopsychosocial Approaches and Evolutionary Theory as Aids to Integration in Clinical Psychology. Because I think what's really important in order for us to get back into the science of what it is to have a mind, we have to think about how minds were built. What are they designed to do? Okay, and one of the things we understand very much about the human mind is that minds adapt to environments for good or for bad. So let's try and think then about um, some of the um, difficulties with the human mind, some of the tragedies with the human mind. Well, firstly, we ha uh, have a whole range of built-in biases. We are, we are biased towards our own when you do monitor, uh, thought sampling, you find that people are thinking about themselves uh, a lot of the time during the day. We're very biased towards our kin. We have kin biases. We want to look after our own, our own genes, not just anybody's genes. This is easily demonstrated. If you have a baby and they take your baby in the hospital away to weigh it, and uh, they come back an hour later and they say, we've got some good news and some bad news. The bad news first, um, I'm afraid we've lost all the name tags and we've got no idea who your baby is. You don't, we haven't got a clue, sorry about that. But you'll be very pleased to hear we have some wonderful babies born today and if you get down to the delivery room, you can choose one, right? If you go, you just go and, you know, yeah. it doesn't work, does it? And humans are also incredibly tribal. Primates are very, very tribal. We now know there is such a thing as chimpanzee wars, Rhesus, uh, baboons, all of them will fight each other if groups meet. This is part of our inheritance. And the reality of having a brain and a, uh, uh, an evolutionary journey that's like that means it's very easy for us to be incredibly cruel. So we know that every 10 seconds a child dies of starvation and at times of famine it's much greater. Well, many of us will live like this this Christmas. We know that many children grow up like this. Millions upon millions of children grow up like this. We know this. And yet, others of us are quite happy to live like this. I'm not particularly religious, but why would you want to invent this way to kill somebody? What is that about? And the Romans used to crucify thousands upon thousands upon thousands. What about entertainment? This went on for 700 years. In the opening of the Colosseum in AD 80, 10,000 people died in the first three months for entertainment. Think of um, Crown of Thrones, isn't it? Crown of Thrones, Crown of Thrones. We, sorry? Game of Thrones. I always get that wrong. Game of Thrones. I don't watch it that much. Uh, some of the statistic uh, entertainments are really quite worrying, particularly for children. 
This is how we used to engage in battles. Men used to go in arm to arm combat with each other. Can you imagine? I just think it's horrendous. That's what we do now. It's the First World War. That's a bomb city in Syria. Humans are crazy. Before we go anywhere near DSM, humans are potentially crazy. They will do very destructive things indeed. And this is how we use our intelligence. We're also very submissive. We do what we're told, even if it means doing bad things to ourselves or others. It's incredible to think just in the last century, six million people died in places like this. And of course, when people like ISIS crop up and everything, we think, oh my God. No, no, it's humans doing what humans do in certain contexts. We should not be so naive. This is a really important thing that I think as clinicians we need to say. We know that it's very easy to get good people to do bad things to themselves and to others. So the fact of the matter is, humans are potentially callous. And we have to take that on, and as clinical psychologists, I think we have to help people understand this. Up until 1642, every major city in this, uh, in this country had a torture chamber. Go to the Tower of London, just down the road, and see the kinds of things they were up to. Hang drawing and quartering, can you imagine that? It used to attract thousands of people to come and watch it. Slavery. Just 200 years ago, 200, just over 200 years ago, British ships were roaming the... Atlantic Oceans between Africa and Americas, full of slaves. What a terrible thing to do. Women have often been used as property, are trafficked, and in marriages are often seen as second class. Even religions have treated women pretty badly. Think of Chinese foot binding. For a thousand years, a thousand years, young girls up to the age of two had their feet broken with rocks so they would live forever in pain. Humans are crazy. You know, we're a clinical science. Let's just look at what humans do and have been doing before we start turning up DSM and all of this stuff. We have the potential to do some very bad things and simply giving it a mental health label or a, a DSM label of psychopath or whatever it is is not gonna do the job. Domestic violence is still a serious problem for many women in this country. We know that many children in inner cities have post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms. Now, I was just at a talk by uh, John Marzilliet arguing about the diagnosis. The fact of the matter is these children are in desperate states of suffering. Okay? So this is happening all around us. We are a species that in certain contexts can be not very good. And that includes also contexts which increase the vulnerability not only to do bad things to other people, but to suffer all kinds of mental suffering ourselves. Now, whether you want to call those diseases or disorders, I don't think is particularly helpful. I think what we need to understand is how does the brain work in certain contexts? And one of the most important things, I think, is to recognition, recognition that over the last few thousand years, Many humans have grown up in very traumatic circumstances that other humans have caused, be it through wars, be it through slavery, be it through domestic violence, 101 things we can think about. And the question is, is how as clinical psychologists can we begin to think about this process and say, well, given what we're up against, how can we begin to build societies that actually seek to bring out the best in us, not the worst in us? Because the last few thousand years we've been building uh, uh, empires and countries that haven't actually always done a, a good job in bringing out the best in us. And I think some clues to this can be understood in terms of motivational systems. We understand that evolution creates different motivational systems. And one of the things that concerns me is that if clinical psychologists only focus on cognitive systems and don't recognize the power of innate motivational systems, we're going to miss quite a lot of the source of doing bad things to ourselves and others. In fact, there was a book I was very influenced by, by Ornstein, Robert Ornstein, called Multimind. And Ornstein said this, the long progression in our self-understanding has been from a simple and usually intellectual view to the view that the mind is a mixed structure 
for it contains a complex set of talents, modules, and policies within. All these general components of the mind uh, can act independently with each other, and they may well have different priorities. And this is like Jung was, uh, Freud and Jung were very concerned about, was the concept of the fact that the mind is made up of these mixed modules, these mixed motivational systems, and these systems can be in conflict with each other, both consciously and unconsciously. So we know then that different motivational systems organize our minds in completely different ways. And therefore, trying to understand how people orientate themselves, how their minds are orientated in terms of the motivational system is really, really important. Here's a study which reviews, this is in Brain and Behavioral Sciences, this is a major review of all the research showing that there are these independent motivational systems that can organize your mind in particular ways and are very sensitive to external stimuli and social contexts. We're not nearly as in control of our minds as we like to think we are. So there are two motivational systems that I'll, I'll start to talk about now as I begin to move towards the second part of the talk. The competitive system, the system beloved by Margaret Thatcher in capitalism, okay, the idea that we all have to be self-focused, pursuing our own self-interest to the best of our ability. Milton Freeman's famous statement to companies, the only thing you need to worry about is the profits you're making for your shareholders. And that kind of philosophy is the kind of philosophy that gets us into all kinds of trouble. There is, however, a, another motivational system, which is a motivational system for caring. And this organizes our mind and our cognitions and our behaviors in a very different way because it's designed to do very different things, right? So let's have a look at this competitiveness. Let's see how good competitiveness is. So supposing you make it, supposing you gain power and you get to be dominant, is this good? Well, it turns out, it might be good for you, but it's not good for other people. There's now quite a lot of evidence that the higher up the pole you go, the less compassionate you become. Intuitively, you would think to yourself that the more resources we have, the more we're going to share. But the reality is humans don't do that. The reality is that the more resources humans have, the more they want to conserve and hang on to them. And so there's quite a lot of work now showing that as you increase the amount of power people have, they actually turn, as Dasha Keltner, this is the Dasha Keltner Laboratory in Berkeley, people start turning the blind eye. Some studies that in terms of leadership, we now know there are an, this, these combination of, of traits that turn up in leaders, particularly as they become, as you move higher up the echelons of power, Machiavellianism, narcissism, psychopathy. These are known as the dark triad. And what's interesting about motivational systems is because they're like strategies, then they will start to try to create the conditions for themselves to flourish. Just like bacteria in your gut will try to make you eat the foods that are conducive to their own su survival, so all strategies and motivational systems will try to create the conditions to allow them to flourish. This is why tyrants work, because they create the conditions in the minds of those around them to become subordinate, subservient to the will of the tyrant. What about how is all this competitiveness, this drive, this ranking, what's it all doing to our children? Well, here's a really important study that was done in the Harvard School of Education uh, looking at this. So, all this competitive stuff which we've allowed to carry on. So this is what they found. Our youth values appear to be awry and the message that we are sending to them seems to be a problem. Um, according to a recent national survey, a large majority of youths across a wide spectrum of races, cultures and classes appear to value aspects of personal success, achievement and happiness over concern for others. So this is based on 7,000, sorry, 7,000. It's all on the web, you can see that. We asked youth to rank what was the most important for them, achieving at a high rate of happiness, feeling good most of the time, or caring for others. Almost 80% of youth picked high achievement or happiness as their top choice, while roughly 20% selected caring for others. Youth also ranked fairness low in relationship to several other values. For example, they were far more likely to rank hard work above fairness. Some youth made it clear to us that self-interest is paramount. If you're not happy, life is nothing. After that, you want to do well. After that, 
expend any excess energy on others. So think about this. If you're going to go for happiness, if you're going to make that the focus, personal happiness, you're going to make that the focus, think about what other psychology you're pulling in. So according to our data, <coughs> youth aren't buying this idea that compassion for others is a good idea. About 80% of youth in our survey report that their parents are more concerned about their achievement or happiness than caring for others. A similar percentage of youth perceive teachers as prioritizing students' achievements over their caring. Youth were also three times more likely to agree than disagree with the statement, my parents are prouder if I get good grades in my class than if I'm a caring community member in class and school. Our consensus with and observations of parents also suggest the power and frequency of parents' daily messages about achievement and helplessness are drowning out their messages for concern for others. So this is important. The competitive motivational system drowns out concern for others. We also did some studies looking at this competitive motivational system, which is rooted deep in the kind of archetypal structure of the human mind. And we looked at what we called secure and insecure striving so uh, insecure striving had these ideas to be valued. I have to strive to succeed. Life is a competition. People compare me to others. And then the secures, on the, other, on the other hand, have the idea that others will accept me if I fail. I don't feel under any pressure to prove myself. You will love for what you are, not what you achieved. And so what does the data tell us? Well, it tells us that this fear, this striving to avoid inferiority, is associated with people feeling left out, losing out, that they will be passively rejected, passed over, marginalized, and actively rejected. And that's true in both students and in depressed people, and very high in depressed people. Depressed people have this real strong sense that you know, if you don't achieve things, then nobody's interested in you. And when we look at in, in relationship to some of the rank-based psychologies, social comparison, submissive behavior, and shame, once again, we find that the secures and the insecures have very different uh, orientations to these. And if we look at depression, again, those who are secure don't feel they have to strive. It doesn't really matter if they succeed or fail. They are still loved. The, this is inversely associated, negatively associated with stress, anxiety, and depression. But if you're striving, you have to avoid inferiority. You've got to, got to, got to, then you're in trouble. We also did a study looking at caring versus competing. So we asked depressed patients, you know, do you feel like a winner? Do you feel inferior? Do you feel others are better than you? And they all said, oh, yes. That's the competitive mentality. But if you ask them, are you caring? Are you somebody who is trustworthy? Are you somebody who would try to help other people? They say, oh, yes. So all this concept of self-esteem, it depends upon the motivational system. It's not general. Depressed patients don't think that they are morally bad or they're not particularly caring. They say, you know, I try and be a caring person. And sometimes they say, I wish people could be as caring as I am. You know. What about the data on anhedonia? So we were doing quite a lot of work on anhedonia in the 80s. Well, um, <clears throat> it turns out that feeling inferior, social comparison, a tendency to be submissive, and a sense of shame that other people look down on you, this, which is all to do with what we call the low-rank self-perception, that's associated with all kinds of negative. That's associated with anhedonia. And here's another study that we did looking at defeat and entrapment, and once again we find that if you just look at the defeat data here, uh, people who feel defeated by life, they feel like losers, they feel pushed to the bottom of the pile, all that sort of stuff, highly linked to depression. And there was a paper, a big, big review paper published in Psychological Bulletin in uh, 2011, 2011 um, on the defeat and entrapment model. And it is a very powerful predictor. So rather than thinking about it in terms of DSM, whatever it is, people's experience of feeling defeated, the ability for them to feel that they can achieve their goals and so on and so on, these are very powerful predictors of people to feel depressed uh, and uh, anxious. And we also know that entrapment, feeling trapped, seeing no way out, is strongly associated with suicide. So basically, when the competitive system works well, you may feel okay and in charge, but there's the risk that you also become less empathic to other people, you become power orientated, you become, you want more and more. It's the system of greed, okay? 
On the other hand, if you do badly with the motivational system, the rank system of, of competing, then you're vulnerable to social anxiety, depression, and all kinds of other things. And part of the reason for that is that if you think the only way you can relate to others is through your ability to achieve, then you're vulnerable to feeling inferior, cast out, unwanted. And the problem is your achievements will only last so long. You're only as good as your last achievement. So what to do? And this is the last period of my talk. Well, there's a good thing we can do, and that is turn to science. So if these motivational systems that are rooted in deep archetypal processes, we can follow them right back in evolutionary time, are very powerful organizers, and if our culture can stimulate this stuff for, for, uh, for, and, and create quite a dark side to our psychology, then what can we do to offset it? And from an evolutionary point of view, we can create a counterculture we can create a counter set of stimuli that stimulates a very different motivational system. And of course, you know exactly what I'm going to say, which is the caring system. And it turns out that actually, we've also evolved capacities for caring, certainly within the infant offspring situation, but also caring for our friends and for our tribe. And indeed, we also know that hu early humans cared for the sick, the elderly, and the injured. And we know that from the anthropological record. Uh, over a million years ago, humans were, uh, were surviving that could only have survived if other people cared for them. Now, the origins of caring are really interesting because it begins with distress cause sensitivity. And Panskips made this very interesting point that distress cause sensitivity actually starts as a threat signal. So animals who hear another animal in distress run. <laughs> if one of your kind is being chased by a lion and is screeching, get the hell out of there, okay? So generally distress signals from another conspecific produces flight behavior. But something happens which is actually to produce the opposite, how to move towards the signal of distress. And that's really interesting. And we can even see this in the reptilians. So the crocodile, Here's the cries of distress or the cries of the hatchlings, and it will go and pick them up in its mouth and carry them to the water. Okay? So the ability to turn towards, to move towards a distress signal actually is very old, and that's really important, I think. So we move really from turtles, our ancestor was a turtle, would you believe? Um, that have no caring system through the capacity to have uh, uh, parents that are responsive to the stress signal through the capacity to be cared for and cared about. This caring psychology is really, really interesting, and evolution has worked on it big time, making it more and more powerful. More and more of your brain is given over to the capacity for caring and being cared for than other motivational systems. So I used Alan Fogel's developmental model when I was developing the stuff on compassion, and Alan pointed out that there are a number of key psychologies that are associated with caring. Firstly is the awareness of the need to be caring, motivation to be caring and to nurture, an understanding of what is needed to be nurturing and caring, a capacity for expressing nurturant feelings, and the capacity to change your behavior according to whether it's successful or not. So the capacity for caring behavior comes with a whole range of motivational processes and competencies that are built in. They're all there. I mean, not just humans can do this, but many other animals can do this too. And of course, caring also gives rise to what John Bowlby called the attachment system, which is the ability to make the world a safe place. So Bowlby pointed out that there are three components to attachment the way in which the uh, mother provides protection and care for the infant. There's a proximity seeking, firstly, the moving towards a source of care and comfort, the provision of a secure base, which allows for the child to have their uh, affect systems regulated through the love and the care and the protection of the parent, and also a, um, a, a safe haven. And the safe haven functions such that when the infant is distressed, they have an opportunity to return to the parent, and the parent's behavior will actually calm the infant. 
These three processes are absolutely essential for the regulation of affect in mammals and in particular children. And we now know they're related to things such as um, uh, physical touch, voice tone, uh, facial expressions, and so on. The attachment system is one of the most profoundly important systems in mammalian evolution. And we now know that a whole lot of brain mechanisms evolved for us to be regulated by our relationships with each other. And particularly for humans, particularly for humans, affiliative relationships are probably the most important regulators of affect. And you think about this, imagine that Tomorrow you get a letter from the hospital to say that you've got a white blood count that looks abnormal. Or maybe you had a bad car accident. What are you going to do? Probably what you'll want to do is to go and talk to somebody or be with somebody who you think loves you. You're going to immediately seek out those individuals who you think will support you, who you can talk to, who you can cry with or whatever. Probably, probably what you won't do is say, oh, my white blood count is up. Let me take out a thought form and check on my thoughts. You might do it later, but not to start with. Now, the point is, that I want to say it to you, is that if we recognize and we understand the power of the evolution of affiliative relations, if we know this, why isn't this center ground to our therapy? Why isn't this center ground to what we help focus on in terms of our relationships, but also in terms of what we're focusing on in terms of what kind of communities we are building. Yes, we can build competitive ones. We can have our kids compete with each other. We can do all that. But what is that stimulating in our brains? Why don't we actually also try to stimulate this process of how we can, for each other, provide a secure base, a safe haven, and be a source of comfort, support, and encouragement? Not only that, but we know that caring has a very profound impact on the frontal cortex and the sympathetic and the parasympathetic system. In fact, the parasympathetic system and the vagal system evolved along with the attachment system, and there's a huge amount of data now coming out about the importance of vagal tone in relationship to affect regulation, in relationship to moral behavior, in relationship to empathy, in relationship to pro-social behavior. Our affiliative emotion systems are profoundly important for how we organize our minds. So the, the affiliative system then it can be one of calming, but it can also be one of encouraging. Many of you will know the visual cliff experiments where the friendly face of the mother encourages the infant to cross the visual cliff. Much of what we do in psychotherapy is to encourage people to face things they don't want to face. The behavioral aspects of exposure aspects of what we do is usually, nearly always, I think, done with a friendly, encouraging way. There was a really lovely study done in, the 80, in 82, I think, looking at the perceived warmth of therapists. And it turned out that behaviorists had the highest be perceived warmth. And why? Because behaviors have to encourage people to go out and face things they don't want to face. And the more that you can do that in a supportive, friendly, affiliative way, the more your client is likely to trust you and have a go. So there's a huge amount of data now showing the importance of the vagal system on affiliative behavior and how the vagal system also is regulated to the frontal cortex and how the frontal cortex is related to all kinds of affect regulation systems. And so it turns out that being cared for um, has a whole lot of uh, physiological effects. The experience of being cared for from the day that you're born will affect your gene expression. It will affect how your stress system matures. It will affect how your immune system matures. It will affect how your frontal cortex matures. It will affect your vulnerability to illness and your capacity for recovery. It will affect core values. It will affect your sense of yourself, the kind of person you are. Are you a violent drug addict or are you a more compassionate, morally orientated individual? So I'm coming to the end now. So what I want to do is just to, I'm going to flick through a few of these um, quite quickly, because I want to show you a video which captures some of the ways in which we engage with um, compassion and therapy. But the point about it is, is that we are at our best, and there is no question about this, the data is overwhelming. Anybody who tells me, oh, this compassion itself, there's no evidence, simply does not know their subject. 
You cannot understand this unless you're prepared to go and look at the psychology data. It isn't in cognitive therapy, it's not in behavior therapy, it's not in psychodynamic therapy. It's in your science. It's in our science. That's where the data is. It's overwhelming that if we are ourselves loving, affiliative, and caring, and if we experience other people as loving, affiliative, and caring, we function at our best. Our immune system, our frontal cortex, our cardiovascular system, our vulnerability to cancer, all of these things are affected by the quality of the affiliative relationships in which we are embedded and in which we take part. So basically then, learning how to be compassionate increases happiness, well-being, uh, creativity, it has a major impact on physiological systems, it improves ethics. So one more thing here. So we have a capacity to be pretty awful, you know, and we haven't treated animals too well, you know, the, the cruelty in farming is horrendous really. But we also have this capacity to be pretty amazing. We can be the most compassionate species there is, but you gotta cultivate it, right? And you gotta cultivate it in the interpersonal fields, okay? And if we do that, and if we really understand the power of affiliative relationships and affiliative emotions, reaching right down into the genetic level, then this is something that we can really work for. Okay, so what I'm going to do is we just go through this. I'm so sorry, I always do this, I get run out of time. So I'm going to just show you this now. This is how it works in therapy. This is a five minute video, and you'll see the power of the compassionate self to do the work. And his voices. You can't do Football it today. Brush your teeth. No way. Football. Get up, useless. These circles represent our three major emotion systems and how they are balanced. The threat system kicks in. They're coming for you. They've set you up. They know what you've done. They'll lock you up and never let you out. You might as well give up now. <gasps> this is too much. It's all too much. Pathetic. <laughs> Stuart's drive system comes online. Come on, come on, Stuart. They don't want you in the team. Miss, go on, miss. <laughs> Stuart is starting a therapy to help him cultivate compassion for himself, his feelings, and his voices. Weak. You're weak for seeking therapy. You're weak. Be a man, walk away. Don't trust her. Over time, Stuart's therapist gradually helps him to feel more safe. They practice exercises that help him feel more grounded and still. Slowing down his body using breathing and imagery, activating his soothing system. Stuart develops an image of an ideal, compassionate person, focusing on each of its compassionate qualities. He tries to imagine what it would be like to step into this image and become this compassionate person. He walks around, acting the part of his compassionate self, getting a sense of what that would feel like, how he would think, what he would do. He practices at home as well, and gradually begins to deepen his understanding and sense of his compassionate self. As Stuart feels safer, stronger and more courageous, he decides to start a conversation from his compassionate self to his most critical voice. Hello. What do you want, loser? I want to understand you. I want to help you feel safe. Safe? Nothing safe around here. If it wasn't for me, you'd be... I know you're trying to help me. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me that I get scared. You're right, I do. But I want to start overcoming my fears now. 
I'm ready. You want to get rid of me? No, I don't. I don't want to get rid of anyone. We can work on this together. Hearing voices is a common human experience. It can often be linked to something difficult or painful that's happened in the past. Although tricky at times, with lots of practice and encouragement, Stuart's compassionate self becomes better developed. Danger! Back to bed. You're not ready. It's okay, guys. Thanks for the warning. I'll keep an eye out, but there's things I need to do today. Um, uh, uh, hey, it's all right, we can manage this. We'll see. Hey! Stuart now feels safe in relation to his voices. He understands and accepts them. They're very much part of the family, but no longer running the show. With his compassionate self in the driving seat, Stuart can now follow his true desires. Just to finish then, we begin to understand the nature of the brain, that it's an evolved, it has a design, it has various components, motivational systems within it, which can be stimulated by our culture, and we just become the acting of these archetypal systems. However, we also have the capacity to become aware, to develop mindful awareness. And you can become aware through thought monitoring or through the process of the therapeutic relationship. We begin to pay attention to what's actually going on in our minds. We can learn how to do breathing, to stabilize and ground ourselves and slow ourselves down and stimulate the parasympathetic system. And we can focus on compassion motivation because that is going to organize your mind and it creates an inner safe haven and in a secure base, as you've seen. And all of the interventions that I suggested at the beginning, the cognitive interventions, the behavioral interventions, they will then work for you within that context. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, clinical psychology can be at the forefront of helping us move the affiliative, compassionate motivations out into the world. How do we get them into our communities? How do we get them into our schools, into our businesses, into our therapies? Because when we feel loved and we're loving, lots of things change. Thank you very much.